Oh, yeah. Welcome here. We're delighted to have with us this morning Rick Taylor, fresh from leading a three day tour to the Chiricahuas for Southwest Week. Very successful it was. Oh, good. So, Rick came down in 1977 and began researching trogons in southeastern Arizona. Kept him pretty busy, but in about 1980, I think it was, he founded Borderland Tours, which took him overseas leading trips for people. And if that wasn't enough to keep him busy, he started writing books. And he's written a lovely little red guide on the birds of southeastern Arizona. He's written books on the trogons of Arizona. And most recently, he's just finished a book, The Birds of Arizona. Also a nice little red book. Now, this book isn't published till next month. But we've managed to get copies here, the very first ones, especially for this festival. And after this talk, Rick will be outside signing copies. So, <laughs> Rick will be talking to us about hummingbirds today. Now, hummingbirds, we see beautiful ones like this with diagnostic features like that, that beautiful purple stripe and the, the black on the throat there, which tells us it's a black chin. But what if it's a female? What if it's an immature? That has us scratching our heads. It does me, I tell you. So what Rick is going to do is give us wonderful insight into how we can identify some of these more challenging hummingbird images. Over to you, Rick. Okay, well, I hope I can live up to at least 50% of that. <laughs> uh, welcome to a talk that I'm just calling a field guide to Arizona hummingbirds. And this is my first time using this. We were only dealing with male hummingbirds. I think that there wouldn't be much of an issue identifying the species we have here in Arizona. And we do have about 17 regularly occurring species in Arizona that uh, represent, say, 5% of the 340 to 350, and they're still splitting, hummingbirds in the Western Hemisphere. They don't occur in the Eastern Hemisphere. Obviously, we had a Rivoli's before, we have a Rufus now. Easily identified, we began with the black chin, which Chris identified for y'all, not much thinking needed there. I have in the book, and I don't know, is it large enough to be visible? A little chart trying to show you the elevation bands that hummingbirds occur in at various seasons, with the reddish being the summer, the blue being winter, the uh, yellow gold being migrants only. What you should notice about this slide probably is that from about 4,700 to 5,300 feet, every hummingbird on this chart occurs and even all of our vagrants but one. So the golden elevations are between 47 and 5,300 feet and it turns out that all of the mountain ranges in southeastern Arizona actually do that. So you're in the right location to see the greatest number of hummingbirds possible. I'm going to start with the Rocky Mountains, the species that were on the left side of the chart. Then I'm going to move to the species that were on the right side, the desert, primarily desert species of hummingbirds. And you can see that on top of the mountains, we have meadows, we have pork bark fir, we have Engelman spruce, we have high elevation Rocky Mountain habitat that has wildflowers. These are delphiniums. And the delphiniums are just now finishing up. The penstemon, the pine leaf penstemons coming on, and the meadows are alive with hummingbirds right now. We're going to start with the difficult species first, the <laughs> salaceris, and I'm going to start by introducing a vocabulary word called splotch. Um, amongst the splotch, it's a sort of a variously shaped spot in the center of a hummingbird's throat. And the Salasphorus, the shining bright or burning bright hummingbirds, females have splodges. The adult females have splodges, the immature females don't. 
the philosophers all have some red somewhere. So this is a Salaspers. These arrows, thank you, Roger Tory Peterson. These, these points, the pins on the, the bird, are to show you that the face, especially the eyebrows of Rufus and Allen's, have red of some sort. You see a little bit of red there. And the rump has red edges even in the females. This is a male rufus. Notice how much red it has on its face. But here's a male allens. And notice that its back is more solidly green than the rufus. And just for the purposes of comparison, also the posture is a clue. The back of the Allen hummingbird uh, is hunched over a little more than it is on Rufus, but you know you can't go by posture because it changes continuously. However, in Arizona, according to Susan Weddington, we have no records of an Allen hummingbird with less than fifty percent, and no records of a male uh, Rufus hummingbird with over fifty percent. Of green. You can't go by the gorget or throat color on these hummingbirds. It can be red, it can be green. It's iridescent. The feathers on a male hummingbird's throat are flat. They don't reflect from all angles. When they do reflect, the flatter the, the throat feather, the more you get iridescence. But here's a rufus. It probably uh, fledged in fall. It still doesn't have any red on the throat. Okay, if you look at the tail feathers, Rufus hummingbirds have broad outer tail feathers and inner tail feathers too. But really, all you'd have to do is look at the outermost primary to separate it from an Allen's hummingbird. This is not hair thin. And notice the notch on the, the tail feather of this uh, Rufus hummingbird. They have a distinct uh, notch in uh, R4, the next to the center feather. The females have broad feathers on the tail as well. Actually, pardon me, that was uh, a male. Okay, here's a female, and just looking at a female Rufus or a female Allens, you couldn't separate them in the field. You would need photographs showing the tail spread. But uh, you can see the range means you would probably only find it down here in southeastern Arizona. Rufus and Allen's females do not always show a splodge. If they're young, they won't have it. And uh, the one we're looking at is the rightmost bird there. Once again, males will have almost a solid back. And timing is important as well. Male Allen's are almost done passing through Arizona. They begin in mid-July. They finish off in the first week of August ordinarily. The latest record is probably around August 12th. This is an Allen's, and if you look carefully, the feathers on the tail are all narrower, or more narrow. How would they say that in English? Mm -hmm. And notice that there is no notch in R4. It's smooth, and it's also narrow. Okay, let's move to some easier species. <laughs> I hope that Rufus Allens is a problem because Allens are so rare. Uh, but you have to get it by the end of this week, pretty much. And it should be a male. Okay, so here's a Salaspirus. It has red on it. 
This is a male broad-tailed hummingbird. And the thing that you can see is it's in mountains everywhere throughout the state. It's our highest elevation. It goes right up to timberline. It's our highest elevation species. And it lives up to its name. It has a very broad tail. Here's a female. And look at how broad the tail is. You don't have a splodge on this female's throat. Typically, they have just green spots on the throat. They don't show red on the throat. Young males, molt in, color just any old place. This is young male broadcast. Here's another young male broadtail. Still doesn't have a solid throat patch. Still doesn't have a solid gorget. There are things that these arrows are supposed to indicate. One thing is that broadtail, regardless of age or sex, has a white, ragged eye ring. It's never red. So if you're trying to make sure that you're not looking at a rufus, look at the color of the face and the eye ring in particular. Another thing is that the males only have a narrow, uh, they have narrow webs of red. They don't have all the red that you saw in the Rufus and the Allens. Here's that round eye ring again. This is what the collapsed tail looks like. Uh, note that because the bird isn't facing you, there's no color at all on them. It's our highest elevation uh, hummingbird. It's adapted for snow. There's another high elevation hummingbird that feeds in those meadows on the delphinium and then on the penstemon and other wildflowers up high. And they also eat gnats as well. And this is a calliope hummingbird. Notice that the spots on the throat converge in a V pattern, an inverted V pattern for males or for females. Uh, if you've read any of the standard field guides, you know that calliopes have wings longer than the tail. You can see that in this photo. What I want you to notice is the broad paddle-shaped primaries on this bird. Calliope have huge wings considering their size. They're not only longer, they're broader than any of the other Scholastrics. Not the tail. Broad tail has a broad tail. The wings, you could call this broad-winged hummingbird, I suppose. They have short bills. Once again, the short tail. And note in the tail the absence of red that you get on male and female Rufus and Allens. There's just no real visible red in the tail. Notice also that the tail is white tipped. All but the center two tail feathers, or rectrices, all but the central two have big white tips. And in this photo, I want you to notice also that it has a distinctive face pattern. Uh, hummingbird specialists like to call this the white lip. It comes from the bill and it goes sort of in front of a dark patch in the eye. I hope that's visible. Back then. They say calliopes have white lips. Can you spot the calliope in this mass of hummingbirds? Sure. It's probably the highest elevation and the most central of all the hummingbirds there. You see the white tips on the tail? Uh, that's at my own home feeders, and the way that I spot them is I look for the bird with the white tipped tail. If you look really carefully at this photo, you'll also notice that there's just the slightest tinge of red at the base of the outer tail feathers. That's why they were recently reassigned to Celastus. With males, you're looking for a striated, V-shaped throat patch. You're looking for the white lip. Notice the arrow on the top showing the white lip. And they often have a hunchback 
posture like an Allen's. What separates them from Rufus and Allen's is they have green flanks. The other two have reddish flanks. Most Salasphorus, and the genus goes right down through Central America, most Salasphorus species like the volcano hummingbird have Rufus flanks. The striations in the throat may not always be that obvious, but this isn't a costus because there's no color on top of the head. And if you look carefully, you will see that there's white lines on the throat patch. Here's one that doesn't have any white lines. This is a bonus bird. If you look at the bottom of the map, you'll see that in 1896, two of these were collected hypothetically in uh, Ramsey Canyon. Mm -hmm. Some of us are skeptical of that record. That guy went into Mexico as well. And this bird can be found up to probably about 600 miles south of the international line. But notice the rich rufous flanks. This is, of course, a bumblebee hummingbird. It hasn't been seen for a century and a quarter in the U.S. run along collected or banded or anything else, anything that would actually substantiate it. Another difference is if you were lucky enough to see it. The poor photos in here, I should say right away, are mine. Put this in for <laughs> documentation. Um, this isn't my photograph, but notice the red that's obvious in the tail of this uh, male bumblebee. Solid throat and a red tail. I doubt you're going to get it this week, but if anybody <laughs> does, I'll come back from my home in the church hours to pick it. Okay, so let's go from high elevations all the way to low elevations. The Sonoran Desert is blends into the Mojave Desert, which is primarily Californian, but we do have Mojave Desert north of Kingman, Arizona along the Colorado River in our lowlands there. Anyway, the Sonoran Desert has a flower that's primarily in the spring, and that's called Ocotillo. And the Ocotillo was important, according to Susan Webbington again, who runs the uh, International Hummingbird Monitoring Network, in bringing in Costas hummingbirds from Southern California. And costas, as you can easily see, have color on top of the head as well as in the throat. Female costas have graduated wings, uh, overlapping shingles on the secondaries and the primaries. The, bir the bird's wing tapers very gradually. They're here they're doing their uh, spear feeding uh, behavior where they feed the two young in the nest by jamming that, that bill straight down their throat. Female costas have pretty much medium length bills. They don't have super short bills, so you fear for the lives of the babies. <laughs> Adult female costas almost invariably will develop a few flecks of color on the throat couple of pieces of purple. It's not so much a splodge, it's just a little bit. Now, a really old female costas can even get a band of color there. She'll have a weekly purple throat. She doesn't get it on the crown. A young male will show that distinctive postocular or behind the eye stripe, that big white stripe. See the short tail here? Male costas have very short tails. And they get a dusky throat that comes in from the bottom. And this is the finished product. The Yosemite Sam of our hummingbirds. <laughs> Having color on the crown as well, it's a feature of the genus that costas and annas belong to Calypte. And this is a male Anna's. Anna's have the splodge that we saw the female Rufus have, and the female Allen's, an adult female 
uh, annas will develop a big throat patch. And they have that postocular stripe. And they have green disky on the flanks. I spoke to Jackie Lewis over at the George Walker house. I previewed this show for, I don't know, three weeks ago or something like that. And she immediately said, it's an Anna's, look at that linebacker shape. She, you know, she, this is a stout hummingbird. So just jizz wise, you're looking for a hummingbird that not only has the green disking on the flank, the shape of the bird is stout. You're a bunch of annas. And you can see that the throat patch can vary in width. These are all females or young males, they're immatures. It varies all over the place. It's not a well defined pattern that you can say, oh, the triangular one maps in annas because sometimes there isn't a splotch if it's a young bird. Young birds typically have gray edged or grayish buff edged crowns. So one thing you can do with almost any North American hummingbird is age it by just looking at the color of the crown. Here's a young male. You can see the feather edging on the top of it if you want. It's not, the splotch is not a splotch. It's molting in color on the throat all over the place. Here's another one. Doesn't just come from the bottom up, sometimes it comes from the top down, sometimes it begins on the crown and then goes to the throat. There's not much you can say about the pattern except that that purple color is pretty distinct. There's no white collar the way there were with the Salasperus hummingbirds, the way we see with the black chip, the way that uh, a broad tail, well, which is a Salasperus for cattle. And there's the finished product. That's an adult male. Color on top of the head, color in the throat. No white color under the gorget. You can see all of the flakes of um, green on the, on the sides there. We have interior basins and an interior desert, Great Basin Desert, that runs way up into Idaho in the American West. And so do black chin hummingbirds. This was taken in southern Colorado, this photograph. This is taken in Silver Creek of the Chiricahua Mountains. Substantially the same uh, arid area in the Chiricahuas that lies in the rain shadow of the crest of the Chiricahuas. So pre precipitation falls in winter, the most important precipitation and it gives rise to one seed juniper, which is the little rounded trees you're seeing there. Here's a black chin. That interior uh, basin habitat is the metropolis or the center of distribution for black chin hummingbirds. In Arizona, they're almost generalists. They move right out of Great Basin Desert into the Sonoran Desert, into the Chihuahuan Desert. There's a teeny, teeny area probably. We don't know for sure because it doesn't get surveyed. It's on a uh, <coughs> testing range, a military testing range where they fire rockets and stuff in southwestern Arizona. <laughs> the fact is that e-birders don't go into that area and it's completely surrounded by e-bird reports. But anyway, uh, the very um, Goldwater, uh, what do they call it? Military range or missile range, that's what they call it, is uh, uninhabited by e birders. So I just said, ah, they're bound to be there, they're surrounded. <laughs> okay, here's a bunch of black chins, and I hope this photograph is big enough that you can see a couple that aren't. The black chins are the ones with the dot behind the eye in the case of male black chins. Females have it too, it's less contrasty. In the upper left corner of this slide, there's a Rivoli's hummingbird. And if you look carefully to the right of the feeder in the back right, you're gonna see uh, a photobombing <laughs> broad-tailed hummingbird. 
We've got a white iron, but it's got a white collar too, so it doesn't just stand out. It's a slightly larger hummingbird than the black shell. Anyway, look at the dot behind the eye. Obviously, a black shed male, regardless of whether those disc feathers iridesce or not, whether they flash you or not, they have to be at the correct angle because iridescence is all refraction. And they have very bright uh, feathers on the lower throat if you're at the absolute correct angle. Here's another black chin, and female black chins have almost the lightest stippling, the lightest throat marking of any of the female hummingbirds. One thing about female hummingbirds that you'll notice, at least in the smaller species, is females have green bases to the tail. Males don't usually, unless they're very young. Okay, from the side, the most important arrow, and I see that I've arrowed it up, of this lean looking hummingbird, not heavy set like uh, Deanna's hummingbird. The most important feature is the second from the bottom arrow. The wing pinches in. Their wing is not uniform. It doesn't just gradually taper down. It pinches in between the secondaries and the primaries. The wings are never uniform. Most hummingbirds do have either wide uniform wings or narrow uniform wings. Uh, this is a young one. You can see that it's got some gray in the crown. You can see very light stippling on the throat. And the bottommost uh, arrow shows a blunt tip to the wing. That wing just ends, it, it kind of hooks up, but it's blunt tipped. This next species is a total vagrant to Arizona. This is a ruby throated hummingbird. And if you look at the wing tip on a ruby throat, it's what hummingbird aficionados like to call falconate. It's like a falcon wing. It sweeps up and it's narrow at the tip. It also has larger throat spots than a ruby throat. And if you can see it, it has a little buff on the flanks. This is a female ruby throated hummingbird. Ruby throats have a broader gorget than uh, a male black chin. They have a black band, just like a black chin, but the band is much more narrow. They call it a chin strap on a male ruby throat. And they have a much more deeply notched tail. Ruby throats and black chins are in the same genus, which is why I'm putting them together in this. Most of the records are probably from southeastern Arizona. Most of them are during migration periods. We have a couple of summer records. We, the first one found in the state of Arizona not that long ago was from Tucson. We were the last state to acquire a ruby throat record in the lower 48. <laughs> so now we're going to go to where you're at. You're sitting in a town that lies amidst outliers of the Sierra Madres. This is a photograph in Barranca del Cobre in the northern Sierra Madre. We're looking from about 7,000 feet down to 2,000 feet in this photo. And here you're looking from uh, Santeo Point in the Chiricahuas down into Cave Creek Canyon. It's fall, so the aspen are showing a little better than they would at you know, in August. But anyway, there's a 3,500 foot deep canyon between Silver Peak and Portal Peak on the right. In the lower canyons of the Sierra Madre, they have Sinaloan thorn forest. And uh, this is a picture of the Rio Mina Plata on the uh, Chihuahua Al Pacifico train line. See the bridge down there. We don't have streams quite that broad, except during flash floods down here in southeastern Arizona. But we do, during the summer, have a lot of streams that come through 
pretty well subtropical vegetation. This is lower Florida Canyon over in the Santa Rita Mountains. The reason we probably are getting these Sierra Madre and hummingbirds is because we have a couple of species of agave, you might know it better as century plant, that flower in July and August. This is a uh, peri agave, and this is palmer agave. And we have whole slopes of this stuff. It's a bat pollinated species, but the fact is that most of agaves reproduce by puffing. They send out runners underneath like an aloe plant in your kitchen windowsill. And um, they reproduce vegetatively. They don't actually, the flowers can be pollinated, the seeds almost never germinate. Sometimes they grow up to 20 feet tall or even a little over. And it's because of agaves that we have a sweep of hummingbirds, not necessarily closely related, but we have a lucifer hummingbird, for example. And if you look at the records, you can see they're almost exclusively in southeastern Arizona. We're doing the southeastern Arizona mid elevations. Now these are found in, the, all of the hummingbirds are found in southeastern Arizona. These are almost exclusively found in southeastern Arizona. Lucifer hummingbird, uh, basically it means light bearer. This is not a moral judgment about this <laughs> particular species. Calithorax, the Latin name means that the gorget extends further down the chest than it does with any of our other North American hummingbirds. If you see a hummingbird that seems to have color, a male hummingbird with color on the chest, it's got to be a lucifer because the others don't. Uh, except for the Amazilia, or the former Amazilia complex. The females have broad postocular stripes, stripes behind the eyes, and they have a long curved bill. It's very distinctive, just like the male. In North American hummingbirds, females typically have longer bills than the males. They're the ones that are formidably armed, and they have to be. Ask any woman in here. <laughs> so the color underneath a female lucifer uh, doesn't have to be orange. It can be quite orange or it can be quite white. A lot of times, older females or young males might show the dusky beginning of the throat patch. You can see that sort of ring coming around the bottom, the upper chest. Young males will show a few flakes of color before they migrate out in the fall. You can identify individual, individual Lucifer hummingbirds, if you have a feeder and watch them long enough, and you happen to live in southeastern Arizona, by the shape of the bottom edge of the throat patch. Notice how raggedy it is on this individual. Sometimes it's completely symmetrical. It looks like somebody took pinking shears to the bottom of their throat patch and just cut it. But sometimes it's almost flat, and sometimes it's in a big, be like Acosta's without any color on the head. They also have that long tail. There's three of them on this particular photograph. And once again, we have a broad tailed male photobombing in the upper right. But notice the long sort of pintail of this hummingbird. They're actually body wise, a very small species and they're subordinate to most other species. And the odd color in this photo is because they come in later than most species to a, a feeder. Over in Ash Canyon, Mary Jo used to tell me, bring your group around 6.30. <laughs> you know, just when we were going to the Mesquite Tree Steakhouse. You know? <laughs> no, don't go. Come over now. Now you can see them. Now, they, they come in at dusk most of the time. Okay, here's another agave specialist that comes down from agave hillsides to feeders 
occasionally. It's quite rare. This is a plain cap star throat. Notice the white patch on the back. Notice the white patch on the flanks. Notice the range is southeastern Arizona. Like a calliope, almost the entire tail is white tipped. These are the, uh, I don't know, unicorn of uh, US hummingbirds. They have an absolute length and proportionate length, the longest bill of any of our US hummingbirds. It's about 1.5 inches in length, which is a long, that's really long if you're only about, you know, four and a half inches long. <laughs> it may not seem like an oh, inch and a half, that's, you know, what is it, one knuckle joint. Here you can see the white tip tail again. Their throat patch only shows if you're exactly right to it. They have this dusky throat patch. Notice how broad the, that whisker stripe or mallard is on this bird. Much broader than any other species we have in the U.S. Here's another bonus bird. We have in Arizona, count them, one record for cinnamon hummingbird. This is a species that Sherry Williamson says in her book is unmistakable, basically. It's entirely cinnamon below. It's got a red bill. There's one record from Patagonia, and that was in the last century. No, it's only about 30 years ago, but Anyway, there's only one record. Okay, so let's go to the uplands of the Sierra Madre. Uh, this is the real Oteros, Oteros in Chihuahua. And this is looking at Cave Creek Canyon in the Chiricahuas. Um, and once again, we're in autumn, the sycamores are changing color. Once again, you have a deep canyon flanked by cliffs. Some of them are pretty stupendous. This is a rock formation called the Nose in South Fork of Cave Creek. And there's some maple too in this photo. And this is where you're apt to find barrel lines and canyon beds. Notice that barrel lines are very strictly confined to just the highest of the border ranges, the Santa Rita's, the Chucas, the Chiricahuas. They really are ex a special of this particular area. And Chris, we got a barrel line on our trip <laughs> at the Southwestern Research Station. It was a female. Um, the throat on this can go a little lower. Sometimes the upper chest is involved, almost like a Lucifer, but that red band in the wing, unmistakable. The one we just got a couple of days ago was feeding on agaves. There's the red band. Uh, they're red billed. The Amazilia used to be characterized by having red bills. But when you say hummingbird is red billed, it's primarily the lower bill. It's not, it's the mandible, not the maxillary, that generally shows the color. There's a lot of contrast on the back of this, like a blue-throated hummingbird. The tail is purple red or purple copper, it's hard to describe, and the rump is uh, brownish gray. It's not all green. I, you know, I used to do a lot of Southern Arizona tours and people, if they describe it to me and they would say it had a green back. Um, <laughs> you know, not all hummingbirds actually do have at least a solid green back. And here we have the, the male, that throat patch slipping down, it's a foot, all the way down to the upper chest. Here's a male, they generally show a tinge of buff on the belly. They don't have a white chin and they never show freckling once they're an adult male, <coughs> once they hit adulthood. But the females are freckled a lot of times, depending on the age of the bird, and the chin is white. And the belly is usually grayish. If you see, if you were really fortunate enough to see, and this is an ancient photo I took 
of a barrel iron on a nest, furred with a green head, a little bit of red at the base of the mandible, you would know it was a barrel iron. Unlike a violet crown, which would show pure white, chin to stern, all white below. And the maxillary on this former member of the Amazilia tribe, um, the uh, upper bill is also brightly colored. It's one of our orange or orange red bill species, or orange pink bill species. You see that it's another southeastern Arizona specialty that actually we have a record north of Phoenix on it, but that's vagrants. So they breed down here. Young violet crowns don't have a violet crown. It's dark gray. Depending on the age, you may get just a luster of purple on top. But it's all white below and with the bill. And then here again is the finished product. The white uh, rejects photographs. It's so brilliant that you don't get any detail in it. It's so bright. I don't even know how a bird can manage to get this kind of white, but they do. I don't think there's going to be much mistake with that one. <laughs> Blue throats occasionally get mistaken for ribbonies, but if you get them right, they have this bright, sort of washed out Levi blue, brighter than any Levi's, but that's the color. Notice the bottom of the tail has got a lot of white on a perch bird. Southeastern Arizona, a few vagrants north of here. They have smooth gray on the chest. Regardless of whether it's a male or a female, the chest is smooth corners of the tail are the largest, physically speaking, the largest white patches you're just going to get on any tail of any U.S. hummingbird. The tail from the top side is blue-black, almost purple-black in some cases, and they signal not so much with the throat as by spreading and flashing the tail. Notice that the rump is just grayish brown, sort of like the barrel end we just saw. To the right of this blue throat, uh, mountain gem, to the right of the mountain gem, you can see a calliope with that V-shaped origin. And the reason I tossed this slide in is not only to show the tail, but to show the size difference in U.S. hummingbirds. Calliope is the smallest of the U.S. hummingbirds. Blue throat is the largest at five and a quarter inches in overall length. This happens to be a male showing a little bit of blue, but it's showing the smooth chest. Uh, the blue happened to come out in this photo by accident. <laughs> it's showing also a short bill. Compared to Rivoli's, blue throats have a short bill. The chest is smoothly gray. There's a Rebelies. Male Rebelies are the Darth Vader of our hummingbird world. <laughs> They're black velvet unless the light is correct. And their bills are significantly longer. This is the only southeastern Arizona specialty that actually gets up to the Mogollon Rim and all the way to Flagstaff, all the way up into the Oak Creek Canyon. Not nearly as common as it is down here, but there are records and now breeding records up there. They're very long built. And they're also very scaly looking on the under parts. They're not smooth, they're scaly looking. This is a, a young male, look at the flanks. It's already starting to mold in some green, which you would never see on a blue throat. And it's just a, a broken pattern of um, iridescent feathers on the sides. Eventually, it will solidify and it will turn black unless the light is extraordinarily good. Short bill and the upper side of the central tail feathers is green. Females have very small gray patches in the corners. They don't have the large white 
patches that both male and female blue throats have. Adult males don't have those white patches at all. They have maybe a little gray on the outer or the uppermost tail feathers or outermost tail feathers in the corners. The only thing that I hear confusion with, the only species I hear Brimley is confused with, is this much smaller broad billed hummingbird. It's about three and three quarter inches compared to five to five and an eighth for rivers. It's primarily southeastern Arizona. It's expanding. When I was a mere child, I never saw broad bills in the Chiricahuas, but now that's it's actually a common species of feeders in the Chiricahuas. Only in the summer, the uh, the purple band there shows where they're actually year round. They're not only expanding into the southeastern corner and the Sierra Madre, but they're also uh, staying year round now. They started in Tucson and they moved south. Young males show some throat color, some chest color. It's from the head or the hood downwards. Eventually, this entire front is going to be colorful, kind of a swimming blue green. Uh, some people think this is the prettiest of our hummingbirds. The females don't have color on the lower parts. This is a young female, it doesn't show any color at all on the underparts. It does show the blue green tail, it's almost blue black in a male. Look at the smooth underparts of this bird, and it's birds like the broad tail that earns its name. It actually has a broad base bill, it has a dull white postocular stripe. It's not particularly vivid, and the ear patch is not jet black. It's dark gray. They have kind of a mask, a female broad tail, broad bill. Easy for me to say. So let's compare those two species. We're going to end with the confusion species. Is that a white ear? It has a white ear. Well, there's a real difference between a white ear and a broad billed hummingbird. A white ear has a much broader uh, patch of white behind the eye. It has a darker face mask and has a much shorter bill. In the case of female, white ears, the color may or may not be present at the base of the bill. If it is there, it's going to be on the mandible, probably not the maxillary. Depends, of course, on our age. But look at the length of the comparative length of the bill. One thing about a female broad bill is the bill is long and it's arching. With uh, a white, white eared hummingbird, you get a fairly short bill and very little arch. You wouldn't characterize this as, oh, it's a big arching bill. They have very long wings, though. Another structural difference between the two. So let's go through white ear, alphabetically our last hummingbird. <laughs> uh, you can see it's, once again, a southeastern Arizona specialty. See the big contrast in an adult between the uh, eye stripe and the, the cheek patch or ear patch. People call it various things. Notice that the top of the tail is green. It's not blue black. It's not blue, you know, blue green or dark green or dark blue, I should say. It's green. It's just uh, basically all green on the top side. And of course, if you get an adult, you have purple surrounding the bill. That's a pretty good clue. So moving down in age, here's a female. Notice how it's not smooth below. The throat, the uh, chest, the flanks are all scaled green. It's not smooth. 
the ride bill is and of course there's uh a photo bombing Rivoli's up there above it <laughs> here's just uh, a juvenile female notice that the throat has green the flanks have green dotting underneath it doesn't look anything like a broad bill and the bill is short it doesn't quite have as much white behind the eye as it will end up with but it's not bad and here's one that's fledged on the day it's fledged <laughs> this is a young male the males will ordinarily always show some color at the base of the bill so as I mentioned somewhere in the slideshow, I'm sure, or PowerPoint, um, I didn't take all of the photos. The ones with cages are the ones at my house. I find that it, it suppresses aggression, and I can get up to 20 hummingbirds at a time at a feeder. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to have those surrounding the, the uh, feeders to get more hummingbirds that drool over. But the really great <laughs> photos were taken by people who should be professionals, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. A lot of the photos that are just to show field marks were the ones I took. I want to acknowledge them here. So thanks very much for uh, attending. I didn't hear any derisive laughter, <laughs> which I'm sure I richly deserved. <laughs> and I hope you learned a few things. Oh, if you have any questions, I, I'll be glad to try to answer. Does the cage keep that bumpy? Yeah. Originally, I got sick and tired of getting up before daylight to try to refill feeders that were covered in saliva and stink. Uh, bat saliva smells like ammonia. Really? So anyway, I have a, a nearby mine that has 7,000 nesting of uh, long-tongued bats and long-nosed bats. Too many bats. In fact, it's almost terrifying at my house sometimes <laughs> to step out onto the back porch because so many bats are streaming by. It's the back porch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not the back porch. Well, but anyway, but anyway, these cages won't deter them at, or whatever aggression suppressors won't deter bats altogether, but they really slow them down. Uh, usually, there's at least some sugar water in the in the basin, if nothing else, so that. Uh, you don't have to be up before daylight refilling them and washing them for the hummingbirds. And that's why I have those. Other questions? Well, good. Thank you.